Okay. Hey, welcome to You Talking with Greg. Uh, it's wonderful to have two of my good friends here, uh, Daniel Fraga and Owen Cox, uh, surfers in the intellectual deep web and owners of the Techno Social Podcast, which I was able to venture over there and hang out for a while. And it's a wonderful opportunity to bring you guys and share this space. So welcome, guys. Hey, man. Awesome to be here. Hey. Hey. Exciting. Yeah, great. So uh, down the road, we'll sort of get it maybe into enlightenment and singularity and how we see this crazy world. Um, but first, I kind of like to get your narrative a little bit. Uh, uh, maybe we'll start with you, Owen. Just uh, give me a little bit of narrative about how you kind of got in the space and what led up to Techno Social and just kind of the um, background of what you're seeing and doing these days. Sure. So, so I guess I was... I was studying classical literature in uh, university a few years ago. And when I was doing my um, master's thesis, which would have been 2017, I was writing about Zizek. And I'd also recently discovered by total accident, Friedrich Nietzsche. Okay. I've been bought an, uh, I've been bought an, I've been bought a Kindle for my birthday and I went onto it and I was a broke student. I was like, what are the cheap books I could get? And I found the collected works of Nietzsche for one pence, which gotcha. is like one cent over here in Britain. Right, so I was right, like, right. okay, I'll read that. This guy's got a cool name. I can totally that. <laughs> fucking like blasted my brain with this guy who was a classical scholar amongst other things. So I was like studying this literature, but getting this like radical Nietzschean take on it, which they weren't teaching me there. And kind of Nietzsche obviously kind of goes after the core assumptions of modernity and humanism pretty hard. So yeah. I was there like, okay, this is, this is kind of like <laughs> radical and this is shaking me up a lot. And then that was the year that the whole Jordan Peterson thing happened as right, well. Right. And so I was there and I was seeing this like kind of mass exodus of some like free thinking, radical academics from academia. Right. Guys <laughs> yeah. who like, I, yeah, I, I found myself like think kind of aligning with a lot of the ideas he was singing out there and kind of vibing with the critiques he was putting forth of the right. universities. So I was like, okay. And then I'd been pondering what the fuck I I was going to do with myself i was like am i going to do an academic career or what but then i was like i don't know the institution classics for philosophy feels a bit dry and dusty compared to right. whatever seems to be happening online and there's all these mm. new podcasts emerging and i kind of at one point got this idea of fuck it i'm just going to do a podcast and start interviewing people and see if i can get interesting people to talk to and i was kind of orbiting in the rebel wisdom sphere for a while and so talking right. to a couple of people that they knew i spoke to um what's his face <laughs> The guy who wrote about the like split brain theory, Ian McGilchrist, he like oh, okay. got him yeah. on the show very early, which was hilarious because I had no idea that he's actually a pretty famous guy. <laughs> and it was like me and my then co-host uh, Dylan Walker just chatting shit with him. And you know, if you watch the video, we edited it so badly that you can only see half of Dylan's face. And Ian's a bit there, like, what the fuck are these kids doing? But it was it was hilarious, and that was how I got met with um, Andrew Sweeney as well, who for right. a time logging right. with Rebel Wisdom and Sweeney, he runs parallax and does a number of sure. podcasts with alexander Bard. people might yep. know him in the space if they don't check him out he's a fucking cool guy and a good friend and then he kind of hooked me up with alexander Bard. and when i discovered Bard, i was like okay this kind of Bard feels like the philosopher and the teacher that i've kind of been unconsciously grasping after in right. some sense like right. he hits the points that jordan peterson hits he hits the points that nietzsche hits he hits the stuff about technology and he's also talking about ancient history and zoroastrianism it's like what the right. fuck? who's this guy and where's he <laughs> been on the scene and i think since then which was about a kind of year and a half ago i've then been swimming in this movement intellectual scene that's kind of been emerging around bard and his philosophy and our kind of network of friends and so you've got the european men's movement you've got this kind of thing that's being called the dark renaissance the intellectual deep web which i kind of see it's it's in the same space as this metamodern and game B stuff. But then there's also, it's, there's a slight kind of different flavor, yep. which perhaps we can get into in a bit. Absolutely. And there's, there's a kind of like fun, playful, creative tension between the two. And uh, totally. yeah, that's, that's where I'm at really. Beautiful. In fact, uh, I just had Bard, Bard's coming out on Monday uh, on you talking with Greg. Uh, and part of that theme was our, our own journeys. Um, and then we were talking about dark renaissance and enlightenment 2.0 uh, from the TOK vantage point. So we can circle back into that and my own relationship with Bard and how TOK and Bard, you know, what their relationship is. That's all 
beautiful stuff. Let's swing in that. But first, let's check in with Daniel. Uh, Daniel, uh, share your narrative about how, how the hell you found yourself into this crazy world. <laughs> mm, it's an, it was an interesting story. So originally, I'm trained as an architect. And as I was sort of studying architecture and being involved in all those projects, I always, find my, I always found myself a little bit at odds with what was asked of me. Um, I felt like there was a very big mismatch between what architects wanted to do with their designs yeah. and what actually happened. There was a lot of pride in authorship, a lot of people singing for a plate, if you know what I mean. And so I felt like there was not that much uh, real stuff happening in there. And I decided to, to start exploring my thesis around something that I ended up calling eventually ontological design or adopting the term. Yep. This idea that when we design spaces and when we design our environments, we're actually designing the person, their cognitive processes. And as designers, as architects, we can have a hand on that. We can intervene on that. Uh, and so kind of taking, taking that uh, as kind of a project, especially with my also Nietzschean, also kind of post-humanist um, temperament or inclination, I, I worked as an architect for a bit. I worked as a in virtual reality for a bit. Then finally, I ended up where I am now, which is in uh, UX design, which is just pure experience design. And kind of the common thread across these different stages of my career were is really ontological design, or the idea that design is about solving problems, not only about the objects, not about what they do to the person. So it's not enough to say that this mug will create a delightful drinking experience, uh, and then it doesn't. What I think is more important is really exploring the, the really intricate feedback loop between objects, say a mug or, or a website right. or society, right. and, the, and the person. Mm -hmm. um, and so based on that, I started to, to get connected first with uh, metamodernism, mm -hmm. with, 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 uh, with Hanzi, uh, uh, and, and that sort of group, eventually Alexander Bard, uh, right. uh, got connected to him via that. And then Intellectual Dark Web, about one year ago, I had a chat with Owen when we met up in London. Mm. We had a few pints, and uh, the rest is history. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. I actually just had uh, Manuel Manga, um, who's yes. uh, on, and uh, he talked about basically his journey in relationship to evolutionary leadership. Um, and one of the competencies and angles that he takes on moving, he's looking at Bucky Fuller and... Uh, Francesca Sferrara and Humberto Maturana. And he himself talked about leadership and the cultivation of ontological design uh, in basically the epoch A to epoch B, which corresponds very closely to game A to game B and cultivating conscious evolutionary awareness uh, to foster an ontological design that would enable a transition uh, from, you know, sort of epoch A to epoch B. And I just echo that because I'm amazed at how much similar threads. I mean, this guy, you know, he's from Chile and or has a background as uh, being trained there. And just the, uh, I've been really impressed or struck by the emerging zeitgeist um, mm -hmm. and the similarities of sort of yearning for what could be and concerns about what are relative to this current culture. And I mean that globally, it's really fascinating. I don't know if you guys seen that sort of trend of sort of see or seeing a remarkably similar kind of vision. The convergence is uncanny to the point that I would even argue that uh, it happens not because of human steering or human desire, but it happens of its own machinic desire of its own machinic evolution. Right. Sweet. That's exactly, yeah. I, and I see that in the singularity, so we can rotate into that. Uh, Owen, you have any, you know, are you seeing that also sort of a zeitgeist shift in a remarkable amount of convergence or? Yeah, I mean, like, it's fascinating how there's this kind of space and there's more and more voices and ideas showing up in it. I'm also kind of mindful that it's also a totally niche miniature subculture. Yep. And it's like, so I wouldn't say I've got my eye too much at like the surface level checking stuff. So like, for example, Peter Lindbergh on the Stoic, yep. where he's kind of tracking everybody and everything that's moving in this space. No, I think I tend to be a bit more introverted. So I kind of have my head down a lot of the time, kind of like studying and like working on stuff and kind of going, oh, that's cool. But so perhaps my feelers, my intuition of what's going on in the broader picture is like less clear. Mm. Um, but it sounds like you like it's kind of right it's kind of correct there's definitely a sense of 
a big sense of this ain't working, right? And we've got yeah. this new technology, but this whatever this was up until now ain't right. working. And there's right. a lot of deep thought and not just deep thought, but deep practice yeah. going into kind of exploring what this transition might mean. Totally. Yeah. For me, the reason that I, maybe it's particularly salient to me is because I'm inside the Academy. You know, my, my journey starts in the mid 1990s, uh, 1996, I get an angle on justification. 1997, I hit the TOK uh, gestalt. And all of a sudden that gives me a whole new angle on thinking about the problem of psychology and how to fix it. And then I spend my career from say 1997, to 2017, inside the academy trying to talk to people saying, hey, here's a whole new pathway. This thing is a game changer. And although I'd have lots of cool uh, conversations, there was no resonance both institutionally or with any type of community at all. So it was like a, this entire experience of banging my head up against a wall at some level, especially in retrospect, I can see that very much. Um, and that's even though I got lucky at James Madison, it's a combined integrated program. It's got lots of innovation in it that's congruent with the vision, but it's really unique and it's kind of isolated or different than lots of others. And even in there, it was weird. So then I'm this sort of like, hi, you know, whatever. Then Jordan Peterson happens. And indeed I end up getting a fight with my program based on Jordan Peterson and a few other things. I get kind of alienated and then follow the wake of Jordan Peterson to here, you know, and then all of a sudden I'm around individuals, okay, that are experiencing a cultural transition from this isn't working to a zeitgeist of uh, ideas. And while there's an enormous plurality of different ideas, I'm also uh, dramatically impressed uh, by the convergence, by the sensibility. The mo there are two really striking events of, of convergence or several really, uh, but I'll speak to myself. One is singularity, which we'll come back to and we'll dialogue a little bit about that. Um, and then the others, this whole meta modern, uh, and the, and you know, I, in in 2011, in my unified theory book, I talked about it as a post postmodern grand meta narrative, and an integrated pluralism, uh, which are very similar uh, sentiments, uh, sentiments certainly to a meta modern sensibility. And then the most dramatic was I, I got pulled in, as you know, to this weird turning my goddamn theory into a garden. You know, that's bizarre for any mainstream academic, you know, finding somebody else that did that in some science, mm. behavioral science, that's bizarre. But I got called to do that for some godforsaken reason I didn't understand, really. I mean, I just felt that this is the necessary sensibility. And then I discovered that, um, you know, the core metamodern sensibility, especially like in art overall, is this ironic uh, sincerity or sincere irony. And when I was like, oh my God, that's exactly the genre that I'm after here. It's a cartoon, but actually unbelievably deep. Um, it both speaks to science on the one hand and ironically theology, Garden of Eden kind of deal, tree of knowledge kinds of archetypes. Um, so anyway, speaking for myself, after being inside the academy for a long time, banging my head up against feeling very isolated to then get popped into a zeitgeist that has that speaks so profoundly to my own um, experience, it does feel like this sort of meta machine, <laughs> you know, socio techno reality that all of a sudden is pulling my spirit into the zeitgeist in the Hegelian sense uh, towards some absolute. It's, it's been, it's been a hell of a journey and bizarre mm. and lots of convergence. So. hundred percent. I think that it's one of those situations where uh, innovations happen simultaneously in different places of the globe, even though they may not be connected, but the attractor point pulls it uh, to fruition. It is as if there's a, Terence McKenna said that history is anchored in the future, or rather the root of history is the future, not the past. Mm -hmm. So it is as if there's an event in the future, retro-causally pulling us all towards it, causing these connections to go towards it. Um, um, I would, you know, as I was hearing you speak, I completely agree with, with you and, and I relate to where you come from because it's definitely uh, a similar journey. And recently I've been thinking that this, 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 um, this discourse around post postmodernism, metamodernism, the new grand narrative to unite us all, the new religion that's not a religion, the way that I feel about that is increasingly that it has to be some sort of after or outside of humanism, mm -hmm. you know, not even post-human, xeno-human somehow, mm -hmm. because 
and, and to pivot a little bit to singularities, I'm tr- going to try to explain what I mean. So Manuel de Landa speaks about not one singularity, but many singularities. Mm-hmm. So for example, mm-hmm. as opposed to the Carswellian uh, singularity, that's one Sing- moment. Yeah. Um, and so, so Delanda speaks, for example, about the singularities in uh, working with metal. So as blacksmiths all over the world would hammer and work with metal and via processes like heating, hammering, cooling down, they would work with this material mm-hmm. to try to extract some already present morphogenetic uh, qualities in it. Mm-hmm. But there's only so many ways you can bend steel. Mm. There's already a thing that the steel wants to be. Mm-hmm. And so once you invent, say, the tube and you add some gunpowder, you've reached a moment of, of singularity mm-hmm. that takes a long time to be reached. But mm-hmm. that innovation triggers very fast innovation after that very right. quickly. So yep. After they invented the tube, they invented ballistics. Ballistics mm-hmm. revolutionized war, revolutionized defensive fortresses, and so on and so on okay. until iron domes and, 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 and all these things we have today in the war machine. I think that there is a morphogenetic potential to the collective mind. Yeah. It can only be bent in so many ways. It wants to be something. It wants to emerge to, to use this, this, this expression that I've heard in the meta modern circles. Yeah. However, it's not up to us to decide to really, to, we cannot be uh, so my 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 point is that as designers as creators sometimes there's a tendency to be too heavy-handed with uh, yep. saying what i wish it would be but sadly and maybe negatively it wants it drives so, one facilitates i guess yeah i think we i mean to me the way i mean I, i'm going to shine my light in a particular way toward the future all knowing that whatever emerges and in created shining it into a, a dark attractor force that obviously is so complex, multifaceted, and will have so many com- uh, feedback loops of generative that allow it to emerge into the reality that the future will behold. I mean, who the hell knows what that's going to be, uh, especially when you factor in, especially at least from my vision, uh, the adjacent possibilities that happen in the, f- in the fundamental channeling, which for me is the digital virtual, uh, landscape and, and the digital virtual landscape being the medium and the tool and the broad definition of what is really channeling the technological aspects of this transformation. I mean, that is so um, outside of the foreseeable, you know, prescriptive, oh, this is what it should be. This is, I mean, as soon as you drop something in there, it changes. Uh, you know, Stuart Kaufman talks about the adjacent possible, which means that as soon as you get a lock, you switch into a key, then all of a sudden the lock key formulation opens up a 6,000 different possibilities. Yes. The nature of the digital possi- the nature of the digital virtual world, <laughs> it's outrageous when it comes to that. So any type of top-down control is, or, or pre-destined um, uh, form is, is, de- de- is either gonna be totalitarian or probably, we probably just not gonna have any power and it would just be bowled over anyway. So it's just a, it's a matter of envisioning and feeding back in the liminal space and being open to whatever Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, like let me just riff on that for a second because so I've recently been thinking a lot about the Enlightenment on the back yes. of having read this book called The Dialectic of Enlightenment by Adorno and Horkheimer, which yeah. is a um, <laughs> terrifying book, basically. Mm-hmm. And I guess one of their core theses is that there's a kind of latent totalitarianism inherent in the Enlightenment humanistic modern project and it can be framed something like this it's like if you the idea of enlightenment is that we're going to use free thought and rational thinking to improve human well-being and to undo the arbitrary limitations and powers of nature over man something like that right that sounds all good if it's like yeah we're going to use free thought and free thinking and rationality to improve our condition but the inversion of that is that anything that appears to improve man's condition and to free him from the arbitrary limitations of nature appears rational. Mm. And so anything that appears to lift man up Mm -hmm. can kind of be justified within the parameters of whatever ideology is constructed on top of enlightenment. And so they argue that fascism, communism are totally thinkable within the parameters of the enlightenment, because what they both promise is lifting up some strata of humanity and doing it by totally 
like rational mechanical means. And then again, it inverts into its opposite in the sense that in trying to free man from the arbitrariness of nature, like free the proletariat from the arbitrary oppressions of capitalism, right, or, right. Or, or but also trying to free the authentic German spirit from the like natural de- naturalistic degradation of the Jew, anything is legitimated. And so the, your force, the, the force that says anything leg- is just legitimated becomes its own blind force of nature. Totally. And so we kind of invert from being trying to be free thinking and rational into just being a machine like the crashing of the ocean or like the sun that goes around or the earth that goes around the sun. (laughs) And we have no say over it. Right. And so this is a fucking terrifying thing to me. And so I'm constantly thinking like within our humanist parameters, we have to be very careful of the latent totalitarianism of the will to build a system that will enable us to lift up humanity that will enable us to kind of do better what we're doing. And so this is where I kind of, I like, I think what metamodernism is doing and striking towards is, is commendable so long as it remains kind of, fixated on the aspect of enlightenment that is free thought and like, you know, open end and doesn't lapse into the improving human conditions at any cost. And then legitimizing that as, as kind of rational or transrational, which is another word. Obviously there's a kind of idea that we'll use transrationality to get out of rationality, but if transrationality, I think could still. And yes, that's great. Um, and a great cautionary note of some of the inherent problems uh, of, the, of the Enlightenment. Um, so, yeah, so that here's what here's where I am in relationship to that, um, because I do I do speak as I was speaking to Bard, you know, that there's I, I see the opportunity for a second Enlightenment, but it's a very different one in many ways uh, than the first. Um, and some of the excesses that you articulate uh, I would put in what I, in Lene Rachel Anderson's meta-modernity model, okay? Uh, I, I, th- I like that, and we can actually correspond to the singularity sum. So it, it articulates the idea of um, human cultural consciousness codes and sensibilities across four different epochs, okay? And the first is the oral indigenous epoch, uh, some say 50,000 years ago to 5,000 years ago. Um, and uh, that you know, is grounded in nature, grounded in relation, uh, grounded in face-to-face dialogue in a particular way, um, and, and holding a particular nest of, of our children uh, in relation and community. Um, you can argue, especially in the horticultural periods, maybe it's got a matriarchal flavor. If you look at like the, the most common artifact is a Venus figure during the last 25,000 years, a big mother earth kind of, uh, frame uh, and the meta modernity sensibility, as I hear it, is to hold that and honor that and rediscover that. And I believe that the oral indigenous sensibility can be contrasted in many ways to a hyper rational, ego, trans egoic, masculine analysis that fails to appreciate what is a justification based on your fantasy relative to some abstract reason that then legitimizes certain kinds of consequences that are disembodied, uh, disconnected from many others, and deeply dangerous in relationship to progress. Um, So to me, what you get with that kind of view is immediately, if we embrace aspects or return in many ways to the oral indigenous, you immediately are going to hold in dialectical tension some of the excesses uh, of and the dangers of, uh, of the Enlightenment, which in my estimation was very much a hyper rationalistic fantasy. Um, about what we can be uh, with the powers of reason, technology, and science, uh, and overcome, you know, the the primitive nature. And that's a very, very dangerous, uh, unchecked, that's a very, very dangerous set of justifications that I think we saw unfold. Um, And Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other piece that, you know, so you have that oral indigenous thing, you have the traditional formal, and I think that's another really key piece, especially now in the West, when we look at like the Eastern traditions and realize their move towards philosophy and scholarship that's so much more embedded in practice and so is so much more also intended to the interior in terms of its philosophical uh, frame is absolutely crucial. I think virtually everybody, to me, anybody that's sophisticated 
um, on the Western side of the scholarship is like, oh my God, what happens with modernity and science needs to be also um, uh, couched in some particular ways with our traditional formal notes is certainly uh, Jordan Peterson's mode and what makes him very appealing in my guard is wait a minute, there's a lot of good conservative reasons for us to think about what systems got built in the traditional formal period of civilization from 5,000 years ago. You know, I'm anchored to the axial age, but our good friend Bart says, screw that, you've got to go to Silk Road and, <laughs> and the Zoroastrian tradition of Bronze Age and bridge it all the way back to there. But, but either Bronze Age or axial age foundations are absolutely central and the, and the wisdom of civilizations that emerge out of the oral indigenous carry, we need to be rooted in that uh, as well and appreciate their dangers, but at the same time, then you yeah. get to modernity 500 years ago and notice this is a really interesting 50,000, 500 years ago uh, to 5,000 to 500 years ago. So by sections of 10 and that actually pattern, I think continues interestingly. Um, so then you get into uh, 500 years ago, you get Renaissance and, and Enlightenment. Yes. Um, and uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, am I cutting you off there? Or you no, not at all. I mean, there's no, I, rambling. I, so. I, I agree with everything you said, but what I think I see, like, so for example, what you've described is holding space within our Enlightenment 2.0 or metamodern right. rational framework for, say, the, the oral, the tribal, the kind of formal traditional and so on. However, what... I don't see necessarily in that many metamodern spaces or discourses it is actually the content that comes up at those stages. Yeah. So I'll give you an example, like Rebel mm -hmm. Wisdom just put out mm -hmm. this new online course yesterday and it's this kind of like becoming a live player course. Yeah, and, okay, yeah, I saw that Peter Lindbergh like Playing games and stuff. And like, I kind of get it. It's like, let's, let's not just be super rational, let's play around. But it also comes across a little bit like an online playground for grown up kids. Mm -hmm. And like, there's no conversation there doesn't appear to be anything about like war, about sex, about love, about, um, I don't know, like money, survival, mm -hmm. you know, these basic things that actually like, that is what the oral tribal level of culture was yeah. dealing with. So it's not like sitting in a circle and talking in a different way. It's actually going into primitive emotions and energies. And I don't see that coming across in much of the metamodern space. It feels, to use kind of Nietzschean words, it's very Ap Apollonian and doesn't really have the Dionysian. And it kind yeah. of, it, it's onto it in that it says like, we need the space for the Dionysian, but then it actually doesn't really get to the Dionysian. Yeah, I think that's right. Kind of enlightenment washes the Dionysian. Because... Precisely, that's a very good way of putting it, yeah. Yeah, yeah because dark visage is, definitionally dark. Uh, Kimil Pagli is, is tremendous at, at analyzing this. And it's a very sober as well. And I think that sobering pathic energy is, is, is part of what I seek to always pay attention to, perhaps by fascination and temperament, perhaps because I don't see it anywhere else, uh, although that, too, that often with ontological design. And if you could frame ontological design as, as, as something of this time and very important of this time, Another thing that, that comes to mind is, is and, and Greg, you, you mentioned this, as you mentioned, the, the different stages in these four paradigmatic stages, the, the oral, uh, uh, I can't recall the, the exact breakup. Traditional breakdown. formal is the next one, and then modern and then postmodern. Mm -hmm. What is each of them tied to, in my view, tied to a new technological paradigm, a new way of doing things. In other words, first, there's a new way to do things that is so powerful that then first goes technology and then people make sense of it. The opposite doesn't work. It doesn't work to say, oh, we need to sort of open the space for this and hope for it to be filled. Uh, it does, I, I feel like I see the way around. Uh, so maybe sadly, here's a thought, maybe it's going to only once AI is, is hyper-personalizing every aspect of our lives and offering us a new way to design our own environments in a very dark way, will we be able to theorize over it and produce um, frameworks over it? Because if, if the opposite might fall uh, uh, under the, the trap of, like Owen said, perhaps overly Apollonian, wishful, 
thinking without too much. It's like theorizing about the industrial revolution without machines. And, Oh, I wish uh, the, that there will sure. be flying cars in the future. Well, absolutely. There's some, yeah. some, somehow I feel a mismatch there. Yeah. Well, I mean, from my vantage point, anybody is trying to just systematize thinking about where we are, where we ought to go and be focused on that and try to jam the system into some preordained system that should work is, um, well, that's just naive, uh, painfully naive at one level. And the system, the reality of the techno uh, social world is going to unfold anyway, unless you actually try to gain control of it, like some sort of top-down totalitarian, which then's guaranteed to be a disaster. <laughs> um, uh, mm, yeah. And that's where I, I, I uh, bring back this idea that technology and the war machine and capitalism all together are this autonomous force that is the egregore that drives civilization. Uh -huh. That is that we, for a long time in history, we actually it, it understood our place in relation to it. Uh -huh. There was, it was a God or it was a pantheon of gods or it was a process and people were quite stacked in these uh, social sedentary structures. In the last in light, since the enlightenment we we've kind of uh, become enamored with the fantasy that we are the ones steering yep. at best maybe it's co-creation but to be honest it's it's a it's a co-creation that goes dialectically and and i feel like we're being dragged uh -huh. i feel like there's something xenogenic the outside uh the, the, the newest fear and its climate that are autonomous the things that we make become like a nature unto themselves. And we relate to them like the climate. Cause it's to what extent is it in our hands? Really? It's, it's a hard one. Uh, that's why in my view, ontological design is composed of sm small interventions here and there, small projects, uh, as opposed to it's also, it's anything, it's many things, but, but this is uh, the way that I see it being deployed in the future pragmatically by people who are actually, you know, going to find the resources to, to, to fund these projects. It's going to be small right. intervention. Right. Yes. Uh, I think so, so for me, the issue is looking back rather than looking forward and then mm -hmm. correcting the errors of the past and then seeing if we can get an upgrade on our ideologies based on error, clear error. Okay. That's where at least the U talk is situated. Mm -hmm. uh, so it basically just says we've made a lot of mistakes and had massively inadequate systems of understanding that we grossly overestimated how clear they were. I can demonstrate how inadequate they are. And there are a lot better ways of making sense in the terms that were structured in the Enlightenment. So on their own terms, uh, there was a, a seeking uh, for a set of understanding that failed. Mm -hmm. And then we want to understand, well, well, not failed completely, obviously, or else we wouldn't have had the iterative feedback between science and technology. But it failed in certain dramatic ways um, mm -hmm. that it didn't need to fail. Its failure is part of our sickness today. So that's the argument from you talk. And the basic argument is this. this is, so this gets into, oh, in, in terms of my own take on the Enlightenment, um, my primary frame on it is what I call the Enlightenment gap. Okay. Um, and this actually positions the what new talk fundamentally is about, the unified theory of knowledge is fundamentally about a new system that addresses, dissolves, and resolves the enlightenment gap. And if we had a shared understanding of the world that could dissolve and dissolve the enlightenment gap and afford us a coherent synthetic philosophy that's up to the task of living and doesn't preordain anything, it simply just says, here are actual schematics that work, okay? What do I mean by that? Well, Newton developed an actual schematic that works quite well for classical matter. <laughs> and that's an actual schematic. Um, now, we know that people thought it was going to work completely well. And obviously, it doesn't work at the level of quantum. And it doesn't work general relative. And he makes lots of assumptions about absolute space and time and the independence of an observer that fails. And really, then, classical matter mechanics is a special case uh, of a much larger set that you need quantum mechanics and general relativity in 20th century, okay? But he develops a very powerful paradigm that actually works, that's up to the task for the subject matter at hand, which is understanding, you know, uh, classically sized objects in motion for human-sized concerns, they put it that way, okay? Um, so that's what I mean by a paradigm. 
Um, and then Darwin comes along and Darwin develops part of a paradigm for living in the sense that, wait a minute, natural selection, evolution by natural selection is a real key piece of the puzzle. Um, 20th century then sees the rediscovery of Mendelian genetics, and then that gets paired with Darwin's theory and the modern evolutionary synthesis. Uh, and you get also the discovery of the molecular biological structure of DNA in the 1950s. And then you have this whole other kind of paradigm where you're like, okay, we have natural selection, we have genetics, which can be specified molecular biologically, that can be paired over across the process mm -hmm. of natural selection. And we get a paradigm for biology, the unified modern evolutionary synthesis, which is not complete, but at least it's up to the task of framing what we mean by mm -hmm. life and putting it in context of the natural sciences. Um, but actually what happens is, is that's where it ends. Okay? We, we have made essentially no coherent progress, at least from the Utah perspective, on affording us uh, solutions to the next level. So biology can take us to neuroscience, all right? And then you have all of this sort of, then you get to the hard problem of consciousness, basically, and the relationship between neuroscience and psychology. And why is that a very, very fundamental problem is because nobody knows what the fuck psychology is. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what my whole point is. And I, I'm not haunted by this problem. I don't know why anybody else is not haunted by this problem. And I'm trying to do my best in terms of like, wake up people. This is an unbelievable, this is way more important than quantum mechanics and general relativity that they don't talk to each other. And we've known about it for a hundred years. And my, the fascination for me is why the fuck doesn't anybody care about this? <laughs> so what the problem is, is that we can't define what psychology is. Um, mm -hmm. And my argument is actually what my study is, is that the enlightenment gap is the reason why. So what is the enlightenment gap? The enlightenment gap is the two sides of a problem that emerges between the science that happens and the science is Galileo into Newton and then the establishment of physics as a foundational paradigm, okay? And then you get the emergence of enlightenment philosophy from say Hume into Kant. We'll just be brief about it. Locke and Hume are empiricists. Kant creates a rational empirical synthesis. Mm -hmm. um, and then you get Hegel trying to synthesize that, okay? But Nietzsche comes along and basically is your first postmodern person and he undercuts Hegel. And then Hegel lives for a hundred years in German idealism uh, in particular ways, but it dies. The, European, uh, the British into American structure don't really pay much attention to Hegel and mm -hmm. give us, uh, us in psychology, a Kantian and Newtonian frame of understanding. We get a matter in motion ontology and a Kantian epistemology and say, mm -hmm. here you go, this is what enlightenment says, okay? But that package is grossly inadequate. And what do I mean by that? It actually can't, obviously it can't solve two huge fucking problems. One, what is the proper way to think about matter in relationship to mind, okay? The system is completely inept, and that's why we have the mind-body problem and all this other stuff. It has no conceptual grammar that's consensually agreed upon to even allow us any real grounding of understanding. It's just a multiplicity. It's a shit show of a multiplicity of different perspectives. That's why, and then you can't really figure out what scientific knowledge is relative mm -hmm. to social knowledge. And how, what, how do you, what is it? How does it have authority? How does it weep back into society? This is then the postmodern critique basically says, no, you haven't achieved any transcendent egoic position that justifies. You're still imminently contextualized in particular ways. And although you might have particulate claims, you don't have a systemic claim that can compete with cultural narratives and, uh, and overthrow them by virtue of rational argument. There are a lot, so this is a postmodern critique against science, uh, modernist, idealist versions of what scientific knowledge is in terms of its truth. So bottom line, enlightenment gap, matter mind, what the fuck is that? What is scientific knowledge relative to social knowledge? You could see them ubiquitously in the mind-body problem and the, and the power of the postmodern critique in relationship to modernism, okay? You put those two things together and you say, oh, the modern scientific philosophical systems that are arise in the Enlightenment get, are, are obviously inadequate to afford us a coherent synthetic understanding of our place in nature and scientific and social knowledge and about our minds in relationship to matter. And the problem of psychology is a natural consequence now of that. It's like, well, you how the fuck could you do a science of mind if you don't know what any of those things are? 
Okay. So that's the that's my place. And what I'm saying is actually they're solvable problems if you know how to look at them the right way. There's crystal clear, uh, done. Like I I don't all the everything becomes old, at least from the unified theory perspective. Everything now is old in relationship to these issues. The the, the issues are actually resolved. And when they are resolved, you then tr fundamentally translate your capacity to understand. And then my argument is that that doesn't preordain what the future is, but it potentially contextualizes our understanding of where we are. So we'll guide the future with more effectiveness, however it evolves. Hundred uh, percent. What a what a tremendous way to frame the the conundrum thus far. Mm. As you were speaking, uh, I couldn't help but to also think about the problems of of not the problems, but the valid points raised by many postmodernists and both structuralists regarding the philosophy of science and, and the way that it is framed and, and really to resolve things into systems. And that's a, that's a critique that obviously has its place in time. It, it, it doesn't undervalue any of these projects. My point being that having gotten to this point, as you said, Greg, that um, we have now resolved so many ways of looking at this, this, this enlightenment gap, um, I can't help but to think of Deleuze as a, as the last, you know, as the father of all the active designers in the future. Cause in that sense, I'm, 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 I'm a designer. I'm not a philosopher, uh, or anything else. And so my inclination is always trying to, uh, look at how to, how to, how to move forward. How does effectiveness come to be? And two things come to mind, the ethics of, uh, uh, or the meta ethics of Machiavellianism, and then Deleuze's, Deleuze's becoming or philosophy of becomings, mm -hmm. rather than philosophy philosophies of how things are. Yep. In other words, processes and what are the looking at the future. My question is less: yeah. what are the systems that we're going to put mm -hmm. forth? Perhaps mm -hmm. having learned from uh, from 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 the resolution of these problems that you just enunciated. I think the question is better postulated as what are the engines or the dynamos or the yeah. processes that we can get right. going. Just yesterday, I heard about hypergraphs by Stephen mm. Wilbram. Uh, oh yeah, absolutely. I had too much time to look into that. Yep, no, they're but intense. <laughs> from what I from what I understood from it, and, and if you know a little bit more about it, maybe you can say. But it's really this engine. It's an engine of increasing complexity that works on its own. A little bit like capitalism, a little bit like intelligence with a big I, uh, the one that's underlying civilization itself as a verb, as a process. Right. Uh, again, that we steer and and we do these these checkpoints. We need to continually do these checkpoints, these these systematizations of knowledge every every step of the way, uh, so that we know what the key, what key is required for each lock, even if at the next step we have 6,000 locks and uh, infinite keys, but we need to do this, this check every once in a while. But my, yes. I guess my main point here is, is, is the verb is to create small engines, small feedback loops. And that's going to be the tool for, for the future. Totally. Uh, you know, and I think that's absolutely right at the process level, at the enactment level, at the design level. Um, when you're, you know, when you're in reality and when you're adding to reality in a way that, you know, can't be preordained, that's exactly the right lensing uh, in my estimation that we need uh, to afford. Um, you know, my, my addition to that simply is we can wake up to how confused we've been in the past. And, and there are very simple terms that we can afford ourselves to then say, wait a minute, we don't need to be nearly as confused as we have. Okay. So the Deleuzian point about the future and the rhizomatic way in which the evolving future can, uh, is actually true, but he overshoots in the, his attack against a tree, okay? And he overshoots mm -hmm. an attack against the tree simply because actually there are, we have overlooked, at least the Utah vantage point, we've grossly overlooked some really key obvious things, okay? Um, for example, to understand our past, if you, like right now, there's a 20 that I believe is available to us. This is 21st century framing um, that says, oh, it wasn't matter in motion, but actually the implicate order underneath matter in motion is energy information. That's what quantum mechanics, general relativity, Big Bang tells us. Starts at an energy information collapse. Um, now, uh, Wolfram 
uh, you can you can drop sort of matter into a couple of different foundations. Wolfram goes for space, okay? I'm not, and I'm no expert in his framing, but I can tell you that Wolfram, um, what he did with his um, holographic frames of reference and his computer algorithm modeling is he created a couple of simplistic algorithms in which he was able to find that he could model the evolution of complexity and the regular habits of patterns of laws and the way in which things would emerge out of relatively simple frames of reference that would then afford you a way of saying, hey, we can now show there's an algorithmic modeling that has certain reductive key points in it. If you say you set the parameters this way, and then it's remarkable how simple you can set the parameters this way and watch an evolution that is consistent with quantum mechanics, general relativity, and the emergence of complexity that can emerge out of that. Um, and he argues then that what that means is what science has done is it's found its reductive points in the algorithm. There's a lot that's contingent, non-reductive, and you know, uh, emergent. But he argues then that you can now model uh, through his computational mathematical modeling programs. You can now model the emergence of complexity in the universe uh, in a particular way. And the holograms that generate holographs that generate in relation, um, you know are proof of that. Now people, obviously it's a new thing and you know he's a maverick scientist and people debate whether or not that's, I'm impressed by a lot of his stuff. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, you talk and tree of knowledge says actually the easiest way uh, without getting into the math and that's not my uh, formulation but it's really a broad descriptive metaphysics that affords coherence on epistemology, ontology and ontic epistemic processes that happen in the world. Um, it just basically says energy information is foundational, okay? Uh, it collapses matter, space, and time, gets collapsed into energy information, uh, and merges out of energy information in relationship to both in the frame of Big Bang at the universe, and at the basement of the material is quantum relativistic fields, um, which are basically describable as non-local packets of energy information. Non-local meaning is sort of I do believe in sort of a multiple worlds at the implicate order level that then cohere and coalesce. So if you go with energy information at the foundation, then you get into the matter dimension, which is coalescing into a single world. I'm not a many world series at the macro level. And then it coalesces into a single world that then has mechanical and chemical process. Out of the chemical process, good questions, but basically we get the evolution of new life epistemic process, okay? which is essentially you get this in feedback loop and you get an emergence uh, yeah. and then you get a feedback loop of what does life do? It's processing information, communicating in particular ways so that it engenders the efficient metabolization of energy so that it engages in work effort that accumulates energy and replicates. Okay? And that's a radically new causal process according to the TOK, meaning that there are, that you have to describe it in the information metabolism language and not and as an epistemic process. And that's why I create the jump into the interdimensional space, which means that not only does it just supervene um, passively, but it actually then engenders an epistemic top-down causal um, feature, which is new. No, you know, people have had a long time, there's been a long-term debate in relationship to a weak emergence, which almost everybody agrees, which is you get aggregates shit together, like a bunch of water molecules come together, to create fluidity. Everyone agrees, well, except for just, you know, you have to more or less agree with weak emergence. And then epistemological, well, we need terms like fluidity to describe that shit. But what people haven't been able to agree on is that there's more than one kind of emergence. Um, there's weak property emergence and their epistemological requirements to describe them. And then there's interdimensional emergence. And the tree of knowledge says it, that's an epistemic knowing process that emerges out of the universe, okay? Um, that's what life is. It's a bio biology really is that life metabolizes information in a new way and creates fundamentally new causal structures. Okay. And once you have that, then you have mind doing it through the nervous system and the animal and persons doing it through language. Okay. And those are now new causal epistemics that are part of the ontic reality. You know? And the tree of knowledge says, hey, those are different now dimensions of complex plane, adaptive planes of existence that cannot be reduced because they're engaged in informational formal uh, complexity processes, which do not reduce to their parts at all. Now, to me, that's a, like, you can look at the history, it's like, we haven't figured that out. You know, it's a very simple model in many ways, but it, we haven't really figured it out. If we get that correct, 
Then what the then how to interpret the Enlightenment, because then it speaks now to the ways in which we can place psychology and the social sciences in proper relationship to biology um, and then other natural sciences with a consilient or coherent picture. Uh, that's going to come bring us back to the kind of natures that actually is a description of our nature that's up to the task, um, that cult wisely cultivating our souls and spirit. And that can then contextualize our understanding for this crazy fifth dimension that may be appearing for, for us with the digital virtual and be like, we ain't gonna control it, but we better know our, our, <laughs> our nature so that we're sort of grounded. And so if we people start coming up with crazy autistic plans about what we're gonna transhumanize ourselves into some goddamn space, you know, uh, you want frames of reference. And I think that me and Bard can frame that in a particular way, like Enlightenment 2.0, Dark Renaissance, does create a particular kind of collective dialectic that says, hey, here's how we can manage the pathic that's neurotic and wounded, that's my kind of thing, with a matriarchic container. And we also have to deal with a dark pathic crazy shit. And Bard's doing that brilliantly, I think, with the intellectual deep web. So anyway, that, I got on a rant. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Uh, I wanted to ask you something. If you, if you could or broadly characterize sometimes perhaps in abstract terms that apply uh, to all the cases. What are the key characteristics of that moment before the strong emergence happens? Of that moment where the preconditions are created and, and how does the strong emergence, how does the spark of light come into being? Great. Uh, actually, I used to use the term strong emergence and I now try to catch myself. John Dervaki asked me not to use strong emergence, okay? Because it does have a tricky history of, of, of terminology that basically the strong, strong version of emergence is magic. Okay? That would never be reducible. And from a scientist perspective, you get yourself in, if you allow for magic, you're now, you're in the, the scientific language game starts breaking down. So John Verveke asked me not to use that term. I used it in contrast to weak emergence and it made sense. So it all depends on what your lineage is. So that's my, so I have to asterisk that. Of course so I think that so then I'm, so now what I, what I, he totally agreed though, that the tree of knowledge, and it made perfect sense that there was a radical difference of emergence between within dimensions. So these, if you think about the tree of knowledge, it just shows the cone of matter. Well, yeah, particles go to atoms and atoms go to molecules and things go across scale. And all of that creates properties, okay, within dimensional, all right? But then something happens interdimensionally. You know, there's, there's an explosion of a new cone of existence. Okay. And what the tree of knowledge says is that it, let's talk at least about the features. So what emerges is a new complex adaptive plane whereby there are units that have information processing systems within and then engage in informational communication between systems. So cells process information and communicate between cells. Okay. Now, what is it that gives rise to this? Well, this is the, the problem of the emergence of life remains a bit of a mystery. Um, uh, the, the, my, probably the best book that I have read on the emergence is called The Vital Question by Lane. Um, he is exploring the emergence of alkaline vents um, in the underlying, you know, there are alkaline vents that have particular kinds of features that afford the flow of energy through particular packets that allow for a lipid cell, uh, I mean, a lipid membrane to them be formed, which can then capture particular types of processes that then metabolize, okay? Essentially what you need is you need a lipid membrane, all right? That's, that's one thing, you need a membrane. So you need a, what, what uh, Friston would call a Markov blanket. Um, so that's, a, that, that's one thing you need. Uh, and then you need a process by which the system brings in forms, both energy and matter substances, and it brings in informational forms uh, to make predictions uh, based on, so it can anticipate which path of investment it takes. Cells do this, organisms do this, animals do this at different levels. Yes. Um, how, how exactly which comes first. So there's essentially, there's RNA world people. RNA world basically means that there's a conglomeration of information storage systems that then replicate themselves. And then mm -hmm. they find their way into a lipid membrane. That's one version. And then there are other people that argue for a lipid membrane comes first, and then they cultivate and grab RNA replication systems. Those are the potentialities that then set the stage for the spark that would bring them together and then create the complex uh, feedback loop. Which comes first, the intelligence or the vessel to be yeah. the strong, strong emergence grammar user here? 
um, because as, as you as you say that, and obviously um, not necessarily playing so much the, the academic language game, I, I I give myself the luxury of um, playing with things like magic for the only reason for the only for the single reason that it. Uh, framed correctly in the way that I like to use it, obviously, and nobody's sure. forgetting for magical thinking, but it offers a grammar to describe certain events uh, in a very fast pace. And this all to say that, um, you know, intelligence or autonomous processes, as I described uh, a while ago with, for example, machinic evolution, yes, we end up um, either finding or provoking the emergence of the lipid membranes and it's kind of a co-creative thing, mm-hmm. right? We yeah. humans might be the vessels for so many of those intelligences. We've, we've evolved a tremendous uh, apparatus for that in our brains and in our extended bodies through technology. And as you were speaking of, of this first, the container, then the intelligence that makes predictions on investment, which is connected to your behavioral investment theory, which is, I think it makes tremendous sense because it reduces it to us, to a transaction, to a very quick mm-hmm. computation. And I, as you were speaking about that, I was reminded of, uh, of something that I'm working on right now, which was this idea that as we enter this era before perhaps the strong, strong emergence or, or, or the, the cone, I don't know how to, how to we can, yeah, to no, it. we can, I can go there now. I just told John that I'd asked her thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if you have a better term, I'll use it uh, yeah. gladly. But point being uh, in this era of chaos before that emergence, Mm-hmm. for that critical mass and the spark bring that about. Yep. I was thinking about and bringing this to social reality, narrative reality, I was thinking about the need for neurological life support systems. In other words, all cults, realities to exist in competition with other realities. Yep. I believe that there will be an accursed share, like Bataille says. In other words, a lot of waste will be produced before something actually sticks and takes root and will be the root of the new cone. Uh, trillions of possibilities will be tested. One or two will, yep. will continue the lineage. And that's the same with our thoughts and reality because we, we predict what's going to happen and then one of them takes hold in manifestation, yep. the relationship between potential and manifestation. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and I guess that that would be, you know, essentially what's going to the next step uh, to create these life support systems and how, you know, with ontological design, I'm trying to work out what are the processes to bring in the intelligence into membranes. Mm -hmm. A membrane might be a reality tunnel. A membrane might be uh, a cult or the things, the memes that I consume or the Mm -hmm. the meme flexes that I inhabit and the the symbolical currencies that I share with the people who are in my circle. Mm -hmm. That's perhaps the membrane. As for the intelligence, I'm actually reading up on Alistair Crowley oh. for the reason that, and maybe maybe this is interesting, but it's because it's my angle on it, it's connected to behaviorism. Oh. Point being, what he was trying to do very crudely and, and resorting to narrative tools mm-hmm. was to create sort of a behavioral association chain. So for example, with tables of correspondences, this magical thing that he used, he would claim that the Venus is associated to the color red and to this scent and to this type of incense and to this behavior. Uh And he's got like books and books and books with Uh infinite pages describing this. In the beginning, I would read this and I'm like, what the hell is this guy on about? Like, this Uh is crazy. But then he said, for the performance of magic, which he would define as the alteration of one's own psychology to perform certain ends, the magician must become acquainted with these symbols. Uh Ah, so you need to imprint yourself with a grammar of associations right. that you curate. Yep. Uh, you know, right now, advertising kind of does that for us and thereby totally. preys on us. The same with culture at large. Yep. So the memes of our own production, of the production of our own subjectivity have been outsourced. Yep. And I guess that when we curate that, we'll be able to engineer the processes to put inside membranes and then we can test a trillion times. AI will help us do that. Yeah, well, mm-hmm. and, and I guess that that's going to be the path to test out the tenable life worlds, the tenable life support systems for the culture of the future, totally. for the cultivation of the culture of the future. Because it, it's, it's going to be like this, this A-B testing, but with trillions of, of potential realities. Absolutely. Yeah, that that opens us up into the singularity, which we can dialogue a little. Um, Owen, was there anything that you wanted to sort of riff off of either one of our 
<laughs> little narratives there. That's great. I mean, you went into like the pretty kind of hardcore metafix emergence stuff, which isn't my, uh, my, mm. my specialty I'll say, but no, like just based on what Daniel was saying there, like there's this lovely framing by a guy called John Michael Greer, who's an American mm. druid. And he talks about magic on occultism as he says, it, it's just performance art. That's the way for people to understand it. Mm-hmm. And so you think like, what is, say, if I want to play guitar, I want to learn like a box suite Well, I go and look at the music and I play the notes and I kind of create a chain of sounds. And if I do it well, I can actually produce an emotion in myself and perhaps right. other people. Well, it's the same what you would do when you would practice some kind of magical spell. Mm-hmm. Understood through this lens of performance art mm-hmm. is that you're invoking some kind of chain, like Daniel was saying, some kind of chain of association, some kind of symbolic currency that exists out there in the kind of transpersonal relational right. space between people in the field of potentialities. Yes. And then you bring that forth in order to enact, and here's the key thing, to really enact a meaningful change in your consciousness and perhaps mm-hmm. in your behaviors. Beautiful. And this is where the ontological, hypoth- ontological design hypothesis is so kind of fun and interesting because we yep. begin to get at a point where we're like, well, if for a long time the chains of memes and informations that we've been using to kind of make sense of our reality trickle down to us through religious texts, through academic institutions. Now in the age of the internet, you've kind of got this guerrilla ontology where just like right. everybody is trying to make sense of everything all the fucking time, which means it's both like fucking, there's a crazy amount of potential and there's a crazy amount for all sorts of fucking what we would call deluded shit to happen. But the thing is that so many of the delusions provide some kind of adaptation. You yep. might be, you might say they perform some kind of adaptation into being, at least in the short back, term. A lot. So, 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 so getting yourself wrapped up in like a conspiracy about the fact that the coronavirus is China or Bill Gates or whatever right. actually provides some kind of short term psychological, um, anesthetic if you will to the like the hard question of what the fuck is going on right now <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so it's like it's not just something like the kind of what you might say like the, the hyper rationalist mentality is to look at something like that and go oh it's just people being deluded but actually the right. proposition is that we've got to go a layer deeper than that because anything that appears deluded is doing something Right, right. I mean, I mean, I think it's exploring all this possibility space of the interface of our dark pathic elements, our own statement about our psyches that we are projecting and then projecting into this completely new digital virtual landscape. Um, and that's one of the things that I wanted to riff off you guys with a little bit. Um, so let, let's talk a little bit about the singularity thing. That was one of the themes I wanted to get into and what that is. And um, so one of the reasons I want to talk to you guys about it is because I, so this thing called the singularity has been around, uh, Graham Snooks it, it coined the term, or at least takes credits for coining the term, I don't know, back in the 1980s, and basically tracks certain kinds of accelerations in particular kinds of frames that would then create a phase shift and a jump into a whole nother layer, okay, of processing. Uh, and then Ray Kurzweil took that, um, view and to zoom back a little further than Graham Sooks did, and then uh, created a time map of various epochs, okay? Uh, the energy epoch into the matter epoch, into the life, uh, and then what he called the brain epoch, what I would call mental behavior epoch, uh, and then into the human cultural epoch, and then the technological epoch, and then he then was thinking about the artificial intelligence epoch um, that we would pass through at the level of what then this becomes the technological singularity. Uh, he's second in command at Google. He writes the singularity is near in 2005 um, and starts Singularity University. Okay, uh, And so this is in the culture somewhere. And this is the technological singularity, which is the idea that we'll build artificial intelligence that supersedes humanity. That's what the, he interpreted. That would be the new jump into a totally new phase shift. That was Ray Kurzweil's frame of reference. Um, Max Borders came along and said, no, I think it's a different kind of thing. What's actually happening uh, is humans are hooking up and what's actually going to emerge is a social collective intelligence. Okay, So then Max Borders then called the social singularity will be some meta 
um, shared intelligence that emerges beyond culture in a particular way that creates a global, you know, it will be bottom, bottom up, but what will happen is a mindset uh, that transcends the old cultural mindsets and becomes some sort of global social mindset, all right? So I thought that was kind of cool that you have a social uh, singularity and a techno sing technological singularity. You guys run the techno social podcast <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. as, an, as an intersection, you know, and think about ontological design and religion, you know, and ways of embodiment uh, in, the, in the 21st century. That's a, that's a cool parallel to me. Um, and the last thing I'll say then is that, you know, uh, I tell people my narrative. So, in, you know, I got stoned one night in 1997 and the tree of knowledge popped out of me. Um, six months later or so, when I'm really thinking about, well, what the hell? I drew these goddamn cones. You know, you start like, what are these cones? <laughs> Why do they speak to me intuitively? Um, and over time, it's like, wait a minute, there's, took me a while to formalize it clearly, but I knew that it had something to do with information processing and communication, okay? That life, that the reason I drew the cone at life and in mind and at culture had to do with the emergence of novel systems of information processing, genetic, cellular, nervous system, animal behavior, and language, and the human mind, intersubjective mind connection to build these systems of justification. Well, once you track that, then all of a sudden you see very clearly, fuck, what happened in the 20th century, okay? What we definitely did do is we laid down a totally new network of information processing and communication. Our material culture now was bridged to fuse with us in a totally different way. So this cup before, is pretty inert when I'm not doing anything with it. So it affords me a way of drinking and all of that. But this damn computer, if I give it problems, it will spit shit back in and out, especially if we build robots, we build the internet of things. We have built a constantly dynamic, complex adaptive landscape at least that is mediated then by uh, digital information processing uh, and gives rise to the affordance of a virtual reality um, that is, you know, outrageously different and potential creates all this potential also creates all this chaos and the tree of knowledge version was well shit we're never going to be able to control that <laughs> okay but it's also the case that it's going to afford us a huge amount of potential either for chaos on the one hand or potential totalitarianism on the other i worry deeply that oh my god if you get a china kind of or worse north korea kind of structure top-down control somebody could regulate all of that and be in masterful control of you now in a 1984 way. So that was terrifying. Um, so what my vision was of the fifth joint point, which is like we're channeling through this idea um, and, and that what's happening is that human cultural intelligence is now gonna get actively dynamically linked with material culture through the digital and that's gonna explode the landscape. So what the tree of knowledge then says is, well, shit, we have to get our social selves aligned with our grounded nature, our best way to cultivate this in a complex adaptive sane way is to anchor it at some level in a coherent understanding of the human in nature so that that creates a stacked robustness rather than say the enlightenment dream of, oh, here's a rational opportunity, we'll deconstruct, de you know, elevate ourselves above, create some transhuman, you know, download ourselves into a computer and take off, you know, what the fuck, you know, that's a very, so anyway, I just thought that that was a cool intersection. The last thing I'll say, and then I'll shut up and see what you guys want to say about this, is three years ago or two years ago, I was reading um, this uh, paper on a singularity. I'll read a few things by Korotayev. He's a Russian, okay? Um, and what he looked at then was these, uh, well, how do you know a singularity is happening? Well, what you do is you measure the time until the next big event, Okay. And what happens when a singularity is approaching is that the time to the next big event shrinks. And then you, that creates a curve. And the singularity is when the time is basically to the next big event is happening with such regularity that it then goes to infinite. Okay. Um, and what he showed was uh, he compared Kurzweil's graph, which Kurzweil used to, 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 to say, hey, the, two th the singularity should be at 2045. And he showed that actually it wasn't just an exponential that Kurzweil use, but it was a hyperbolic exponential. And what that meant was that then he could fit the line a lot better and it would cross at 2027, okay? Not 2045, because it was actually accelerated at the tip. He then found this other Russian guy, Panov, Alexander Panov, who completely independently of Kurzweil, because he's, they, wasn't, they weren't in the same intellectual, and Panov's a Russian, had a whole nother data set looking at major events, 
which were only very loosely related to Kurzweil's. Most of them had all these different. Well, he applied the same equation to Panoff's data set and gets a curvature of crossing the singularity at 2029 with a regression curve of like 0.994 on the one hand and 0.996 on the other, okay? And so, which is in social science, that's like on a simple mathematical macro level thing, you know, that's not shit that we see. Um, yeah. So to me, uh, you know, when you speak about Daniel Frager, Daniel, when you're talking about the, you know, there's a machine force that is somehow in some weird macro level self-organizing process um, is pulling ourselves in a particular way. That's a, to me, that's an empirical, I mean, scientifically empirical slash spiritual thing. Um, and, and I find this intersection, this was, this was enormously moving to me, the idea that independent of me, and then I find my little baton of energy sort of plugged in to be oriented toward trying to cultivate a revolution that's going to now cross over in 2028, okay, is, is really bizarre uh, to me. And if we took the whole cultural, now if we go back to what the tree of knowledge identifies as the culture person plane of existence, okay, and then in terms of sort of my meta framing of meta modernity, here's what it looks like. So 50,000 years ago, we have the oral indigenous system now in full swing, okay? So that's 50,000 years. We then jump up by a factor of 10 to 5,000 years and we get bronze age into axial age, traditional formal sensibility, okay? Then we jump a factor of 10 to 500 years ago, you get the Renaissance into enlightenment, okay? And the emergence of modern science and modernist sensibility and the capital labor relations that go global. And 50 years ago, you get a postmodern critique, okay? And just about five years from now, <laughs> we're literally on a line to transcend culture potentially into the beginning emergence through a fifth joint point of a digital meta-cultural, meta-modern digital virtual space. And there's a goddamn fucking empirical line that is like can be identified in relationship to that. That always gives me a little chill. I love so how yeah. excited you are by it. I, <laughs> I think it's a beautiful vision and I really hope it happens. I'm, it will. The, the thing I hold oh. is this pessimism. I think that this totalitarianism that we fear mm. is, is to some degree likely. You know, I think there's a lot of us working very hard in our tiny little subculture to put our ideas out there and try and get them with traction. But we ultimately have a very rigid cultural elite mm. and increasingly rigid. And we also have kind of learned over the last year that it is well within the toolbox of our governments to adopt temporary kind of like militaristic solutions. You know, we've got a problem, let's lock everybody inside for a year. So if the environment throws up some shit at us in the next 10 years, if there's some kind of warfare shit going down, you know, lock everybody inside for 10 years until the greenhouse gases clear up. So, you know, this stuff is always in the back of my mind. I mean, what I almost like imagine us moving towards is something that resembles a little bit like the Russian empire in the 19th century, in the sense that there's a kind of like autocratic re control regime, but there's also a wildly productive cultural underground that produces in the same way that the Russians kind of produce some of the best literature, the right. best music ever in the 19th century, despite having basically czarism and a very social, social environment. So I, I almost think that that's, that's probably the likely outcome, at least mm. in the short term. And then the work is kind of spreading that and building cultural institutions, educational institutions that spread another way of being slowly, mm -hmm. but ultimately because there's so much potential for chaos. And I think at some point, you know, the solution to the chaos, we would like it to be learning to surf the chaos in a creative and kind of enlightenment 2.0 meta modern way. I think, the much easier solution is well, clamp down on the chaos. Mm. China yep. style. No, I, I, I'm very aware, uh, very afraid of that. I, I echo that. And so I, I, it's really weird because I hold this pessimistic and and uh, sort of dystopian view and this optimistic view. And and they, I'm trying to cultivate a, a, a positive dynamic process between them. But I but I hold them. Yeah, pretty yeah and I think that's the thing to do. It's like you have to on the one hand, stare into the, the abyss and on the other hand, kind of glare at the sun and be like, that's where we could go. Beautiful. Daniel, you guys mm -hmm. look like you had some thoughts. <laughs> uh, I, um, I completely agree that we're on the verge of some sort of moments which will 
uh, for me, represents sort of an ontological Armageddon, as in technological conditions and their influence on culture and people's habits, et cetera, with the addition of the geopolitical pressures and governments keeping control over people, et cetera, pressures that Erwin mentioned. And if you add to that the Googles of this world and their relentless, you know, being larger than nation states at this point and their relentless drive, obviously, for power, it is as if culture is itself performing a decentralized Manhattan project whereby soon it's an arms race and soon there will be such a, a, true, a vast alteration in lived reality and life worlds as a consequence of 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 the the convergence of exponential trends that you know pointing towards the end of the decade will somehow generate these these the, this this immanentization of the eschaton mm. which mm. is in history the whenever it happened that someone wanted to make this vision real it was always very you know it doesn't end too well and then technically they're short-lived moments they're bursts yep. of of energy, not with many happy endings in there. And I think that that and the singularity are this, it is to bring down the ideal into the real world uh, whenever men want to amenitize the Eshetal. Um, but this time it's happening on its own. And that's the weird part. And so for, from in my wildest ontological design fantasies, I sometimes start to speculate about what it could what, what the future could look like and, and, and I, what I think is going to be is some sort of, you know, a geopolitical struggle, struggle mediated by large technology companies where they interfere in every aspect of how we make sense into the, in the world, mm -hmm. these grammars with which we associate things. And they're going to just steam ahead, steamroll our, our behavioral imprints that are there from the past and just install a new software because they can, because the technology and the incentive is there. So, you know, in the same way that just, just to zoom in on that, that grammar, you know, there are the, the sacred part of our collective grammars are things like democracy, freedom, and, and, and the more profane things about that grammar are things like a pharmacist using a lab coat and shaking someone's hand when you meet them. Um, these are things that will become design fodder Tabula has a canvases for uh, to be designed. And uh, the thing is that there are the means to, to imprint this. It's gonna be like Alexander the Large from that other movie by Kubrick. Um, I forget, I forget the name, but it's going to be this sort of uh, very intense. The ability is there. And if the ability and the alibi and the will is there, I do expect it to somehow be 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 used by the Chinas or maybe by mm -hmm. the United States of this world. Yeah, no, it's very scary. The prognostic is not good, but the means are there. And so for me, in many ways, ontological design is also self-defense, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, right. which is creating self-sustainable life worlds to kind of sustain this ontological Armageddon. Vladislav Surkov, Russian Russian uh, advisor to Putin and, and theater director, so he comes from the narrative world. He's got this, this thing, this, this short story called uh, Sky, No Sky, Without Sky. And it's a story about how, it's a very metaphorical story, but in it, the sky over his village falls down and the debris kills his parents and his family. And then he becomes part of a group called the Two Dimensionals. Hmm. This to me uh, is metaphorically very plausible yeah. Obviously, we we're looking, we're predicting, we're we're still a little bit far away from the singularity, mm -hmm. but to me, it's plausible from the negative side. Mm -hmm. But again, it's the old story of of negatively mapping the possibilities. So the ship invented the shipwreck. Electrocution was invented by electricity, but it also allowed for the light bulb. Right. Uh, and so what's what we're in, what we're facing really is uh, this antechamber before history and its long preparation mm. open up mm. uh, old traditions speak about this all the time we have we have russian orthodox calling this the breaking of the katekon and, and the unleashing mm. of gog and magog and the antichrist uh, revelation of christians also says the same mm. kurzweil says it's going to be a singularity that that will bring many good things so so it's, it's, it's anybody's guess at this point, no doubt. but what's not a guess. It's that it, in my opinion is that the means 
will be there yep. to perform this scale of things. Mm. And to be honest, that's what I want to know. That's what that's that's my 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 object is the okay. What's the how to? How right. can you guys do it? Because it will be possible to be done. Right. Hmm. And somebody will do it. Hmm. This is where we become very Nietzschean, right? <laughs> well, we're I like, think we we're going to be like we're always designed by our circumstances and we're designed by the systems and the ideologies that we live in. And like I said, a moment ago, advertising as culture has been a very successful kind of design project, whether it was designed by explicit intent or whether it was a kind of emergent property of the economic right. system that existed in the 20th century, what it essentially did was allowed for mass social cohesion on a level never before, before mm -hmm. achieved. Mm -hmm. And what I'm kind of expecting here is that some kind of mimetic equivalent to advertising for the 21st century mm. that will be there. You know, you will consume your information flows and the information flows will be like Coca-Cola news. That's, that's mm. a latent property and kind of inherent within within what's what might become and this is where i become quite scared of like the um the these ideas cool. of like universal basic income like it's mm. big within the silicon valley crew like a lot of the silicon valley ceos say quite explicitly we kind of want to have a world where everybody's basic needs are met and then a few people get to come and work for the tech companies mm. <laughs> and of course, the question beneath that is how do you enforce the stability where everybody is kind of comfy and satisfied enough to not actually want to do anything other than just do that? Right. Like the, kind of, the brave new world nightmare. So yeah. here's where I'm really with Huxley over Orwell. I think what is kind of perhaps latent within our system, if it doesn't completely collapse, is a kind of bread and circuses with the internet, porn and VR video games for yeah. a lot of people, and then a tiny ruling elite. And I just think that ontological design to me, like as Daniel said, it's almost like a kind of self-defense thing, but it's it's like your little, <laughs> your spear to go hunting in the woods as opposed to just kind of be lock it, being locked in the cage. Right. Well, huh. There you go. There's a real like Christianism to it. Beautiful. And so, so like I said, this is where I feel like quite pessimistic. But then there's also this optimism, like like creatively, the possibility space is absolutely incredible. Right. Right. And diving a little bit more more into that possibility space, the hope is that we'll able to we'll be able to go here. But we need to be. Uh, we need to be sober enough to understand that that's a hope. Yep. And hopes are enacted by ability. Without industry, without the petrodollar, without the freedom of, of innovation and of business, mm -hmm. America wouldn't be able to sort of protect the West and, and, and the world. And we believe that those values are good, like democracy and freedom. But these things have a basis, not on idealism, but on pragmatics yep. in many ways, which is which obviously lends itself to a lot of contradictions, which is... You know, we're going to drop freedom on other countries, namely bombs. And that's a contradiction. And there's so many of those at the pragmatic level. And I think that it, what I'm always realizing is that when it comes down to it, when it comes down to it, the, 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 those who are able to perform power will because they can. Mm -hmm. Those who cannot perform power will criticize it because they cannot exert it. That's, that's what Dan Fagella speaks about. Uh, he, he's a friend of ours. He's, he's, he's an AI expert. He consults for the UN and, and for many companies in the US. And this is what he says with regards to AI, that uh, the coming revolution will be... Uh, that's why I said my ethics is Machiavellian. The coming revolution will have a lot of this in it. So it's going to be a matter of pragmatics, a matter of power and the performance of how to say the correct opinion will be less and less important in face of the technological shift that will drag everyone else with it. The Luddites, they're in, in many ways, they are this example of people who are wishful 
against technology. They wish that it wouldn't steal their lives, that it wouldn't change the, their worlds, but it did. And history is that. History is that, is that, you know, history is for the most part littered with disease and death and poverty. And, and uh, there, there's actually some memes saying that, you know, if you were 30 or 28 in the year five, you would, you would say, I've lived a long life. I've, mm. I've had a berry once, a strawberry once. And mm-hmm. Once I ate meat, that will die of 17 children. Mm-hmm. 16 died. That was a good life. Mm-hmm. And, and today, no, we have this mm-hmm. amazing prosperity and, and things have changed so much, but we cannot forget the fact that that's kind of the underlying reality of, of things. And that's why, why I, I like to come back to Machiavelli, not because I like him, but because sadly so much of what he says with regards to power and, and it's, it's processes is correct. Mm-hmm. Those are uh, where rubber meets the road forces, right? Uh, of influence and, and drive and technology. But the Promethean spear is always there. And the one well, that, 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 you know, you have to, I mean, from my vantage point, right. From my vantage point, the, you know, the, <laughs> the, uh, the energy is to be directed toward the wise outcome. That's what you can do in relation. And it can. And and now like to, to shift gears a bit, I do believe that's to be anchored to the flow of the right outcome. And this is me being again, an advocate for strong, strong emergence, or, or that's mm. my magical intuition speaking. And I can go on about that, but nobody will dissuade me from the embodied knowledge that there's a path. We are not helpless. And there's right choices, mm-hmm. correct choices. We may want them, the correct to be a thing and maybe the correct will be pragmatically something else. Mm-hmm. We need to adapt, but I do, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of, and I trust that, that idea that we can and we will invent our way out of this. Yes. And uh, you know, Jordan Peterson will talk about sort of the ethic of the process in relation, meaning that, you know, obviously you can have a, a goal, but really it is a valued way of being. And certainly I speak to that also in my own clinical work uh, and living up to that and being a part of that. And then that allows the thing and process and unfolding and uh, complexity that's inevitable with uh, the contingencies of the unheretofore seen contingencies of the future uh, to adjust to, but it allows so um, at least you do your responsibility to orient toward the right ethic, uh, you know, mm. the right, uh, the best uh, possible decisions, being both realistic and, and hopeful. So, but here's where there's kind of an interesting conversation and exploration to be had around that concept of sovereignty, which gets mm. it, it's like a popular meme within a yep, lot no. of the space, and it's like, it's like. On the one hand, yes, totally. Like, an, you know, sovereignty is defined as being like being able to remain grounded and whole and present in the face of many different complex and unpredictable experiences. Like, yes, that's obviously like a fucking powerful character trait to develop. But there's also kind of, again, implicit in that concept of sovereignty, I think, a kind of subtle to- totalitarianism over your on your drives mm. and i it's it's almost like a it, i see it as almost like a development of the puritan moral ethic and i mean it's no coincidence that it's emerging out of north american thinkers mm-hmm. exist within you know, a lot of the thinkers are coming out of america britain scandinavia yep. post puritan countries mm-hmm. so we have to be mindful there's yep. kind of a puritanism implicit in a lot of these ways of thinking and it's like puritanism was great for conquering a new territory you know it did the american settlers very well but it has a tendency to rigidify in a kind of conservative ethics that actually doesn't really leave it open-ended and right. that's again where it could become an unfortunate kind of to legitimating tool in the power of some kind of power elite without even really realizing it. And this is where, like, I think we. Oh, and I think you broke up a little bit there. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Could you repeat yeah, the last uh, 15 down. seconds, please? Yeah, we lost you there for a second, Owen. The last sentence, maybe, or two. Oh, what a shame. I was saying, I think this is where the concept of kind of like pathos and Dionysian that we explore yeah. over in our dark renaissance circle come in because it's like yes be sovereign and then also have the space where you totally let go of your sovereignty within like a a safe kind of like cushioned environment if you will but the only alternative is to just kind of get locked into being sovereign over yourself and what does that sovereign mean ultimately you're kind of defining what sovereign means mm-hmm. and i think there needs to be something totally other than whatever it is yeah and no i i think that that's um you know, that again and then again, that to me again is like a principle and it's like designing the spaces that we're looking forwards going forward into the future it's like they need to kind of carry a space for their own inverse if you will if that makes some sense sure yeah yeah, I mean, in the therapeutic space, uh, you know, that I live, uh, a prominent model is internal family systems. Um, and the internal family systems model, um, sort of in the way Bard talks about dividuation, um, it emphasizes the, the magnitude of subpersonalities and the need for plurality in relationship to mode. Um, it does also counterbalance that to, get to in a sovereign way, sort of, uh, seek to afford the opportunity for some coherent integration between the modes. Um, but yes, this is a, I think in certainly in psychotherapy speaks often to, well, what's the, what is the proper dynamic relation between a self-conscious person that has sovereign regulatory control over, you know, sort of the animalistic dark pathic. Okay? Um, and at the same time affords it at the opportunity to speak, to grow, to manifest into the, the chaotic into the non-rational into any number of different domains. Uh, and so a, mm. a, a healthy opponent process between those two goes back to order and chaos. If you do a Jordan Peterson spin on it uh, in some regards, I think that that's absolutely correct. And that you can, you can overdo, you know, the hippies of the nine and, and the sort of the free emotional expressive people, uh, at least in America, California, you know, like, Oh yeah, just a, you know, release, um, with any unfettered control, and we see clinically, no, that actually is not good, either for the individual mm. systems. Uh, at the same time, an obsessive, ruminative, perfectionistic hyper-control in the service of being a good person is also uh, uh, disastrous and overcompensation on the other side. Um, so there will, I certainly think you can have, uh, there's available, clear science of the self, uh, of the evolution of consciousness, of the narrative, the stuff that John and I do, which would say, yeah, there's actually healthy opponent process uh, between secondary rationality and primary emotional animalistic process. Uh, there's healthy dynamic and relation there that actually affords good integrated sovereignty in, in the adaptive sense without uh, clamping down in a way that is, well, the enlightenment errors that you were referring to, I think would carry you potentially into hyper-rationalistic and uh, control yeah. and, and dangerous, uh, you know, an Ian McGilchrist narrative about, oh, propositional alignment of, a, of analysis that then disconnects the actual embodied perceiver, knower, uh, and uh, doer. Um, and it is definitely uh, the yeah. needed frame will have uh, to have both. And I guess, like, again, that like to even play back against that a little bit, like, you know, this definition of healthy, like, would you say, someone like Jimi Hendrix had healthy psychological integration. Would you say Van Gogh had healthy psychological integration? Probably not. These guys were fucking nuts. And they're like, you know, like Hendrix was doing fuck loads of drugs and died when he was young and he fucking innovated. He created something that was impossible. Similarly with someone like even fucking Freud, right? Massive cokehead. And yet perhaps if he wasn't doing all that coke and fucking failing to resolve some kind of shit in his childhood, he might not have come up with psychoanalysis. So there's always this kind of like dialectic itself between healthiness and unhealthiness. And again, trying to kind of posit a, even trying to posit a healthy relationship between your sub processes and sub personalities can lend itself towards a kind of stultification, a kind of rigidity. And maybe that is what is actually 
you know, what 90% of people will naturally seek and naturally desire. But then there's the 10% of us weirdos who are kind of out here. We're almost like predisposed to reject the labels of health and say, and we're going to go and fuck ourselves up, but we're also going to come up with some shit that's mostly incoherent and occasionally something really interesting. Absolutely. Love it. And that's totally true. Uh, at least in my, and so I will speak then as at times a rationalist, egoic, a uh, psychological doctor that says, no, actually, we do need sort of a generalized, somewhat rational, regulative control system for 90 percent of the people. Um, and from an overarching view, the people that are actually chaotic and broken live at the bottom and don't create anything brilliant. And there's one miserable life after another that is overly chaotic. And yeah, if the state's going to employ you or some general regulatory mechanism is going to employ you, you'll be a secular priest. Um, and actually, I do see that as kind of necessary. It needs to be philosophically reflective and very open to the defiant critique, uh, uh, you know, of this human spirit that says, fuck you. <laughs> yes, absolutely. You, know, you, absolutely you absolutely need the dark, dark pathic. That's why I love the dialectic with Bard, because he'll go yeah, psychoanalytic, yeah. he'll go tantra, he'll do all that shit. And I'll just come in and basically be like, well, I'm just kind of a suburban. I have three kids and a wife. I married my high school sweetheart and I'll afford a rational. And the point of it is, is that neither one of the, the alone, they're dangerous. Uh, in in in, yes. the, in healthy opponent process, they actually afford the right um, way to balance between chaos and darkness on the one hand, and then a rigid obsessive control on the other. There's actually ways of of, of filing that, and and every society is going to have its. I hope it's weirdos. I mean, if it doesn't, it's going to turn into North Korea for the love of fucking Christ. So a, any system, I think, would want uh, to embrace uh, deviance uh, at mm. some very important level. Yeah, and I think it's super important to be including this within our kind of theorizations of future systems. And also important to not let anybody from this dark pathic thing anywhere near the serious positions of responsibility and power. <laughs> that's how you end up with a Hitler, right? You end up with this mad fucking magician shaman in control of one of the most advanced economies. No, that's not where they should be. So, hmm. As I hear you guys, I think about the term technologies of deviance. Technologies mm. of, um, as opposed to technologies of transcendence or uh -huh. self-actualization and, and really ontological apparat ontologic apparatuses that have impacts on ontology uh, or, or, or in the life world of an individual. And it's, uh, it is as if in our environment, we are surrounded by memes and apparatuses in this really complex configuration of, of, of elements that frame, that frame our affects, that frame our power relations, that influence the decision balance that we compute at every second with our behavioral incentive systems. We can, of course, broadly characterize some as uh, dark pathic and others as overly rigid or vice versa, or some as disordered and some as chaotic. But there's a, it comes a point where these are, this is the preliminary conversation. This is the introduction to the book, mm -hmm. whereas the actual book is the, okay, uh, which ones are which and what do they do and how do we compute them? How do we weigh them and how do we produce them? Um, because it's, I, I feel that it's, it's going to very soon be high time to get down to the details. Um, and I think that in these circles, we have so the, the right preparation. Because uh, when I, for example, when I collaborate with big agencies and, 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 and in the tech world, I sense that the problem is the opposite. There's a lot of realization and not enough preparation. Well, there's a lot there means and people are already doing technological solutions galore, but uh, it's, that there is no, <clears throat> there's not this level of thought and preparation from the philosophical point of view. Um, and yeah, that's why, I don't know. That's why I would like to you know, get a Peter Thiel on this conversation, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, sure. get a, you know what I mean? Obviously, yeah, absolutely. Well, this Point is actually, this is, a, I think, Daniel, your point is really what my, uh, you know, 
my hope is for this space largely. And the reason that the whole you talk with Greg uh, sort of podcast thing was, hey, we need to lay some groundwork. A, there's a lot of hopeful and powerful threads that have emerged all of a sudden in this zeitgeist. There's some machine that is calling us together. Uh, I want to converse about that. And I want to do it with as much sophisticated philosophical framing and wisdom about the human condition, about the current context, about our history, about science as possible. If we can lay the groundwork, you know, and have a frame of a healthy opponent process. We talked on many very different elements. It's sort of like there are healthy opponent processes. And then clinically, I know there are extremes and then fragmented and uh, aggressive con deconstructive processes that create vicious cycles. Uh, the clinician in me is always like, hey, how do you cultivate the healthy opponent process? Make it flexible, make it fulfilling, make it growthful, adaptive, make it creative, uh, make it robust. And these things pull against each other. Right. But there are ways and I've seen people live lives that you're like, damn, that's a good life to live, you know, uh, and at an individual level, damn, that's a horrible life to live. That's a life in the gutter underneath the bridge or at a societal level. We've seen, oh, my God, that's Auschwitz. That's a horrible life to live for society. Um, and if we carve out the philosophical terrain, uh, maybe we will be able to guide whatever is coming in a slightly uh, healthier way. So that's what I'm hoping for, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Any uh, kind of as you got to look out, you know, the, I know, you, you know, the, there's plans for the IDW party, uh, but as you guys look out to the sort of the future and uh, or any other comments you want to leave the audience with as we begin to wrap up here. Um, the only comment that comes to mind is, is Deleuze's idea that the only thing that the wise person knows how to do is to create, 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 invent functions, innovate. I feel like uh, if we are given to perceive certain things, then we must put them out there into the new sphere and let it do its magic. Because if we don't, then we're kind of forfeiting something I feel that's very, that is important and we shouldn't. Beautiful. So. Amen. Well, we'll throw that, we'll throw this out there into the new sphere. <laughs> uh, Owen, any final reflections? No, I don't think so. Mm. Let's get creative. Let's get Peter yeah. Thiel on the U talk soon. Like right. I said, <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> well this lays the ground. We're got, I'll have to bat up a little bit. I'll climb, <laughs> we'll climb up into the stage. I'm still just a little hermit down here in Stewart's draft. So you got an intuition to fish out the guy, the good stuff. So yeah, no, we'll, uh, the, the, we got a bead on several things, and I do think that something's happening. So uh, and you guys definitely a part of it. I really appreciate. I guess you guys. the thing something comes to mind. Something to to just to leave people thinking, because I think about it a lot. It's like what I already touched on. What is the connection between a lot of the ideas in the spaces that we're in and the kind of Puritan ethics? Mm. I think that's a really kind of interesting historical lineage. Right. That's at least kind of fun to ponder and yes. perhaps fruitful. Because what does Puritanism bring? What does Protestantism bring? And what does it not bring? What does it exclude? Right. And right. that might lead us to some of the blind spots in this North American, British, Nordic-led cultural movement. Right. Well, given that we, I think we mostly met on Bard's list, at least, at least we're part of something <laughs> that's fairly far away from that in many ways. So yes, I think that's a deep uh, and wonderful reflective concern, you know, uh, for us to be aware of. Uh, so. Uh, in that, I appreciate you guys coming on. Thanks so much for your time and your insights, Thank all you. the good work you're doing in techno social, and uh, we'll circle back in uh, at some point. So you guys, hell yeah, care. man. Greg, take care of yourself, man. Thanks so much. All right. Bye -bye.